So first up is Stav Jung with an Inkscape update. Uh, I'll give a quick introduction. I'm probably not really needed here. Uh, talk about uh, the upcoming release and then a little further down the line with SVG2. In case anybody doesn't know what Inkscape is, it's a vector graphics editor using SVG as its native file format. Uh, the one thing I would like to mention is that the developers are foremost users, at least traditionally. Uh, it was artists who were the main developers who, who forked it from Sotopodi and, and started adding things that they wanted. Uh, and, and this re is reflected in the features that, S that Inkscape has. For example, live path effects, where you can take a the lizard as a path, and then you can put it on another path. And then later on, non -destructive, it's a non-destructive uh, uh, transformation that you can then go and you can change the path and you can have your lizard wiggle around any way you want. Or for example, the tweak tool where you can take an array of uh, objects and then you can push them around randomly, randomly change their colors. These were things that were put in because the users wanted it and the users were the developers. Uh, cartoonists, the, the bucket fill was something that they did. There's some font designing stuff in Inkscape. Uh, a lot of, uh, use a lot for uh, diagrams for scientists and mathematicians. There are many extensions to make nice figures or to embed equations into uh, figures. Uh, scrapbookers, there's DX, DXF export for tabletop paper cutters. Inkscape is used to make designs for uh, engravers, woodcutters. There's a map making extension. Okay, so. That's a little bit of introduction. Now, what is the status of Inkscape? Well, currently, Inkscape version is 0.48.4. It's mostly bug fixes. That release was over two years ago. So where is 0.49? I'll answer that in a little bit. First, let me tell you what's in 0.49. It's a major refactoring. It was planned to be a long release cycle. Not this long, but it was planned that it, we were going to take some, uh, make some major changes. And the biggest change is using a Cairo-based render. It's faster and it's more accurate, produces more accurate rendering. There's also some caching of complex objects for faster rendering. There is a move to lib2geom, which is a, is a geometry library for manipulating paths. It gives you faster, more accurate path operations. There's improved snapping and, and many, many, many other behind the scene changes. So let me talk about Cairo for a second. Cairo is a 2D rendering library with multiple backends for Quartz, X11, Win32, PDF, PostScript, even SVG. Uh, there's OpenGL back, uh, backends being developed. It's been used by Firefox, the GTK Plus WebKit, the, the GTK Plus uh, version. And it was used in Inkscape for 0.48 for outline mode and for PDF and PostScript export. Well, in Inkscape 0.49, it uses Cairo for all rendering. And this was done over uh, two summers. Most of the work was done over two summers by a Google Summer of Code student. So the benefits, as I mentioned, increase the uh, speed of Inkscape by at least a factor of two. And even more if you use lots of gradients and filters. The filters are accelerated by OpenMP. There's a reduction in memory use up to a factor of four. And complicated objects, as I mentioned, are cached now, which also speeds things up quite a bit. And allowed rendering bug fixes uh, especially in patterns. Okay, other things, improvements, uh, the gradient tool. There's an improved gradient toolbar. Everything that used to be in the gradient editor dialog is now in that toolbar, so we can say goodbye to the dialog. The stroke and field dialog has had some enhancements. The gradients are, are listed, and you can sort the list by color or name or number of times they're used. You can rename your gradients in the dialog, so it's easier to keep track of them. You can duplicate the gradients and then make changes to uh, the copy. The text tool has received a lot of work. Uh, if you know 0.48, you know that there was a bold and italic buttons. Well, that doesn't match what's used by font designers very well. 
those buttons have been replaced by a drop-down menu, allowing selection of all variants in a font family. For example, Deja Vu Sans has nine different font variants, and those are all accessible by the drop-down menu. Uh, the text unit has changed to points instead of pixels. There's an improved font family drop-down menu. The fonts that are in, being used in the document now appear at the top and in blue. Often you're, you, you are using Inkscape to modify an existing file, and sometimes the fonts that were used are not on your system, and you're warned now by a, a red line through the font. Uh, you can also, if you need to change all the fonts, if, if you're missing a font and you want to change it to something else, you can now select all the text objects that use, are using that font family by clicking on the button up, and, up there. And uh, it's not obvious, but uh, font family fallback lists from CSS are supported. You can actually put multiple fonts in there, and it'll do the right thing for CSS. The Node tool has received a, a few changes. Uh, there's a, something here that uh, allows you to put nodes at the extrema, uh, which is useful for, for uh, designing fonts. There's a new measurement tool, also motivated by people interested in, in font, using the Inkscape for font design. It now measures across uh, objects, so you can make sure all your stems have the right, the right uh, thicknesses. There's a new symbol dialog. Symbols uh, in SVG uh, are defined by a symbol element and Inkscape will go through a document and create a pseudo-library of all the existing symbols that are being used in a document and present them to you. There are also, you can also have libraries of symbols in an SVG file, and if you drop them in the right folder, then they will appear in the dialog and, uh, and you can use them. There are two sample libraries. There's a logic library and then there's the, the travel symbols here. You can also use Visio symbol files by dropping them in the same folder. And in the future, possibly you'll, you'll be able to use arbitrary groups in Inkscape as, as symbols. Uh, there's a power strokes. In the beginning, there are Bezier curves. Version 40, a point four zero of Inkscape introduced calligraphy paths. And then point four six. Pattern, you put a pattern along a path, so here is a oval shape put along a path to make a nice uh, stroke shape. But that was a destructive operation. In point four seven, we had live path effects where you could do the same thing in a non-destructive way so that you can then later on change the path and uh, the sh shape remains the same. And then in point four nine, we'll have power strokes where you can edit the stroke width. So here's an example uh, a curve, and you can see the purple points. Those are little handles, and you can change the thickness of the stroke using those handles. And you can add new handles if you want. You can also cho choose the, uh, the, the cap and the join styles. And there are a few extras that you don't normally find, uh, like the, the peak uh, end cap. And out of this actually came uh, the person that uh, implemented this, implemented an extrapolated line style or arcs line style where you carry on the curve. And this was such a good idea that uh, I brought it up to the SVG working group and, and they liked it and now it's going to be part of the SVG standard. I'll show that in a, in a minute. A uh, new feature with, with the uh, live path effects is the ability to clone a life path effect. Because the problem was you have one path, that's your source path, and then you change the width of it. Well, in SVG, what you need to do is then have an object that you fill. And so you lose the ability to fill the fill. The fill. And so by having a duplicate uh, cloned LPE, you can now also fill the inside. Uh, other SVG improvements, uh, there's some work to make the 
SVG output by Inkscape to be a little more web friendly by removing, optionally removing unneeded attributes and style properties. Inkscape has a habit of just filling all the styles uh, in, some that you don't need, some that are invalid, uh, some that are inherited that you don't need to specify. Uh, a few, uh, 0.49 will be a little uh, more complete in terms of the SVG standard. The clip rule property is now supported, although there's no interface for it. The color interpolation filter value of linear RGB is now supported. If you ever created a, uh, uh, or took a drawing that had a filter in it that was created somewhere else and brought it into Inkscape, often it wouldn't look quite the same because Inkscape only, only supported sRGB filters, which is actually not the default color interpolation value for filters in SVG. Also, you can now, uh, if you put text along a path, you can now place it along that path by setting the start offset value. Uh, there's new export uh, facilities. You can export Flash XML. You can export uh, Synfig uh, file format, so you can import it into Synfig and XAML. And import, you can now import Visio files. Uh, and there's a new internal Coral Draw import. There are lots of new extensions. I guess I'm not going to have time to go through all those. Uh, a new grayscale mode, a new align and in the line distribute dialog, there's a, a new possibility to ex exchange selected objects in different ways. There's a new find and replacement dialog. So you can find and replace a, a text or a particular attribute that you want to change. And there are new ways of, of doing selection of objects. So where does 0.49? Well, there's still a few bugs in it. Uh, but the biggest bug that was holding up, is holding up 0.49, is the scaling of bitmaps. If you put a bitmap into Inkscape that's been scaled, reduced, or enlarged, you get artifacts. So on the, on the left here, you can see at the bottom is a single line, above is, is, is a, a few white lines, and that bitmap's actually larger than what you're seeing. It's been, it's been reduced down, scaled down. And you see, you no longer get a, a, a straight, nice white line. Uh, what you want is more what you see on, on the right. And, and that was done, that the problem there is that Cairo didn't support very sophisticated scaling al algorithms. It's just basically nearest neighbor. Uh, and that was a, is a result because Cairo relies on the Pixman library for handling bitmaps. Recently, Pixman has included better scaling, but there's no API in Cairo yet to take advantage of that. We may be able to have a temporary workaround so that in the end we may be able to get, not have to wait for Cairo to adopt uh, an API. But now in doing that, we've discovered we have a upscaling problem. Norm normally when you're upscaling a bitmap, you often want to keep the blockiness. So if I take the smaller bitmap on the, on, on the le uh, left and upscale it, what you want is in the center. Well, it turns out the SVG specification says you're supposed to use a complicated scaling algorithm when you upscale, and you end up with what you see on the right, which is probably not what you want. Now, a few of the, the browsers uh, get around this. There's actually an attribute you can specify whether to use a quick scaling method or a more sophisticated scaling method. But you're not supposed to use the quick scaling method if you have the resources to support the, the, the more sophisticated scaling. And the more sophisticated scaling gives you what, what's on the right, what you don't want. A few of the browsers, think like Opera and Firefox, if you specify the quick upscaling, we'll, we'll give you what's in the center. But you can't rely on that because WebKit doesn't do it that way. So there, there's a possibility in CSS, they actually have recognized this problem and they're changing the meaning of, of the, or the values that you're allowed to have with that attribute. 
uh, to something that says, I want to keep things blocky or not. But that's a little ways off. So we have to kind of figure out what to do with this, uh, how to handle it properly. Uh, now let me talk about the future. A few things people are working on is a port to GTK3, on-screen tessellation editing, improved guides, of course, more bug fixes. We are participating in Google Summer Code this summer, so hopefully we'll have some nice projects coming out of that. And of course, we're looking forward to SVG2, and it'll offer us a lot of things. But we need to have to figure out how to integrate that into Inkscape. It's kind of like a chicken and egg problem. We can't have our SVG being exported as SVG2 if the browsers don't support it, support features. So we have to figure out how to do that. You know, for example, a mesh gradient. How do we handle mesh gradients? Well, we can have, possibly we can have a PNG fallback in there. But we have to figure out exactly how to, to implement that. So here, here, here's uh, the mesh gradient. Uh, we used Inkscape as a test bed for the, for the SG, SVG proposal, which has been approved uh, for mesh gradients. So if you have a trunk version and you've, if, and you've enabled it, you actually can edit mesh gradients in Inkscape. Here's some examples. Here's the, uh, the peppers that were missing from my SVG talk. So you can tell which is the, the real and which is the, uh, the, the vector graphic there. Uh, well, it's still black. I think that's a Firefox problem. Uh, hatch fills are another thing that are now in SVG too. So that's something we can add to uh, Inkscape. Unfortunately, SVG2 is not going to include everything that we want. For example, it's not going to include vector effects. Uh, things like being able to define a path as a, as a bunch of subpaths. Uh, this is interesting for, for like map makers who have two countries touching each other and you really want to have just one path to find that boundary. You want that path to be shared. Uh, if that's something that interests you, you should let the working group know because the more people that demand things, the more likely it's to be implemented. Uh, also, control over the stroke position that was part of the vector effects uh, uh, thing, and, and that's not going to happen, it looks like, uh, for SVG2. Uh, things like multi-page SVGs, multi-line text entry, text in the shape, that may happen in SVG2, uh, may not. Perspective transforms should be happening because it's happening in CSS3, we'll have to see. Also, there's a screening filter primitive that I'd like to see in, but that's not going to be in soon. Uh, I guess I can skip that. Connectors, that's not so important. Warp text is something that people have asked for. Being able to warp text between two lines. Right now, you can, you can put uh, text along a path, but you can't warp both the top and the bottom. Also, there are a few problems. If you see this, this office here, you notice how the the, the uh, ligature has that nice curve. You can't get that right now in SVG 1.1. There, there's some prob problems. And part of those are, could be political problems or uh, uh, some fonts don't allow, licenses don't allow you to have access to the point data, which you need to do that nice uh, curve. So that's, that's the problem. So anyway. That's the, the status of uh, Inkscape. I take two questions. I have one question which is uh, quite a technical uh, problem with butt-ended lines, butt-capped lines. When you have a large change in the direction for, uh, in, the, in the very end of the lines, um, yeah. the shape that is um, the result is uh, not really defined in the SVG specification. Um, and I know Cairo does it wrong. Inkscape is a little bit better, but not good. Um, so do you know if there's any work going on on that or um, if there is any interesting interest in discussing this? I, I'm, I'm not sure what the problem is. Well. Oh, for Should I bring it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. 
in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, some things are difficult to put in questions. You, have, you can answer something to this, or hmm? you will talk to him later? I'll talk to him about it, okay. I, I have to fully understand what the, the problem is. But he understands the problem. So, Hello. Um, so you mentioned that uh, there are some improvements to the uh, rendering, like using better scaling algorithms. Is there anyone like trying to uh, separate the export and the preview, because uh, when I hear that we're going to get improved scaling algorithm, what I hear is scaling is going to be slower. Because um, I have, I love Inkscape, but what I have problems with is that there is no separation between uh, the need for high quality output for the export and then having a very um, responsive interface while I'm working on it. There is, there is a value you can set in the uh, preferences. The value for the oversample is the same for while I'm working on the, on the graphic and when I export. And it's only important for me to have high quality output. But when I work and I zoom in, like it, it affects even like blurs. Uh, when I zoom in, to my work that includes like uh, bitmap textures and, and I have blurs, it's freaking slow. But I do want eight I, times over sample when I export. Have, have you done 0.49? Have you, is that? Because uh, no. things are a lot speedier in okay. 0.49, especially, especially things like blurs, because that's a filter. Right. And so now you can use all, you know, OpenMP, you can it uses all the processors and Okay. Well, I just it's a, so, uh, that's a lot. Twelve core machines. So there, there is something. <laughs> that there is something uh, where you can set the filter quality. It will use the highest quality when you export something, and a lower quality for the screen. Right. But that's, that's but for that's upscaling and downscaling, that's uh, okay. There's there's no difference. Thank you very much, and uh, another applause for Davion and Inkscape. <laughs>